in the joy and in the wonder and in the solemnity of this Palm Sunday. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I was a kid growing up, we never read the story of the Passion on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday was always separate, and it was kind of like after all of that Lenten gloom and gloom, and it's kind of like prelude to the joy of it. The problem was, you would come and you would hear the Passion read, and you would hear it on Monday and Thursday and on Good Friday. But now people's lives are so busy, and their work schedules are such, they aren't coming on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and the church, wherever the church is, decided no one was hearing the story of the Passion. You can't really appreciate appreciate Easter without hearing it, so they tacked it on to Palm Sunday. And so now Palm Sunday is both Palm Sunday, and we end the service with the reading of the Passion. Today we begin Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. And let me tell you, it is a great deal of work. It is a great deal of time and energy and creativity. And it is not just my time and energy and creativity. It takes the participation and the music and the creative and the writing and the drama. And yet we go through it all again and I wonder why is this week so important for our Christian faith? Why do we need to observe these services? Why do we need to do it again? It's not like the Bible story has changed from last year. It's the same. It's not like we're going to a play or a drama where you're going to get some entertainment value for your offering dollars. It's not like we are going to poorly mimic a reenactment of what happened back then, like a museum holding on to relics. It isn't even to experience the comfort of a well-worn tradition in the retelling of an old story we've all heard, like a bedtime story as we all huddle together under the church in here once upon a time. It's important for us to be part of this week. It's important for us to do it all again. It's important for us to do it as well and as creatively as we can. Because God's divine drama isn't done. It is still playing itself out. And it is still being written. And it is being written today here with you and with me. And we now are the characters in this drama. We begin outside and we enter this place not because Jesus processed into Jerusalem long ago. We do it because the loving presence of God continues to enter into the Hui Lutheran Church and it continues to enter into our lives and into our homes today. We start by crying out Hosanna, the divine statement of hooray. Not because it's scripted in the bulletin, but because our God continues to come to save us. He continues to save us from the sting of death from brokenness, disease, from our failure, our shame. <coughs> this morning we come and we lay our palm branches before this altar, not to create a red carpet runway as if at an award ceremony, but because we continue to lay our lives down before this Lord who comes to us this day. And so we start once again the Holy Week drama that is still being written, and today we hear Act One. Palm Sunday. At the presence of Jesus entering Jerusalem, the crowds cry out, Hosanna, literally means, Lord, save us. They pin their hopes and their futures and their dreams on this man riding on a donkey in front of them. And yet by the end of the service, we will hear in the Passion that same crowd calling out, give us Barabbas, and ask for Jesus, crucify him. It's one of the incredible mysteries of Act 1. How do those same people, those same crowds, go from Hosanna to crucify? How do I in my own life seem to go so quickly from Hosanna to crucify? While I was studying for the ministry, I lived in Washington, D.C., and while there I needed a cheap place to stay. So I knocked on the door of the Augustinian Monastery. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monastery before the Reformation. I said, you guys want to try again? <laughs> and they were very kind to me, and they said, yes, we would be more than happy for you to be here. But they had one condition, and the one condition was, if I lived there, I had to be part of that community and participate in every aspect of their life. I went there, I moved in, and on the very next day, the beginning of every day in their monastic life was to enter this beautiful chapel 
with these wonderful carvings of beautiful stained glass. And we would gather there every morning at 6 a.m. And as we would gather in silence, all of a sudden from the back, a cantor would shout out, Give glory to God, our light and our life. And we would all respond, Oh, come, let us worship the Lord. And then he would sing, Oh, Lord Almighty, everlasting God, we thank you for bringing us through the danger of this night. And I thought, what an incredible way to start each day. These wonderful sounds in this beautiful place lifting up. And I said, can there be anything better? Nine months later, facing finals, I gathered in that same place with my eyes shut, sitting there half asleep. And I heard, oh Lord, let us praise the Lord our light and our life. And I went, oh come, let us blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I wondered what had happened to that kid that was so thrilled to be there on the first day. And now could care less so I could get on with my life. And all nine months there was this steady grinding. This steady, constant demand. Never quite measuring up. Never quite being finished. Always under some external pressure. Always placing some kind of internal pressure. And it was just the constantness of the every day. And the joy was sapped. My sight became dull. When you listen to the reading of the Passion in a few minutes, listen, and it's only found in Matthew's telling you. And in Matthew's telling of the Passion, he has this line. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas instead of Jesus. They came there that morning. They were not anticipating asking for Barabbas. But they had to be persuaded over time as they slowly began to get infiltrated by the chief priests and all the demands of the world. They didn't come there that morning wondering, how can we fail God and how can we deny this Jesus? But over time, and that continued pressure, living under Rome and the authority, unfulfilled expectations, failed hopes, past hurts that wouldn't heal, slowly they begin to forget the joy. Their sight shifts away from this Jesus and all of a sudden they begin to see all the rest and they look outside. Most of us did not come in here today and we didn't start the day wondering, how can I make God angry with me? Or how can I fail this Jesus? But as the week grinds on and our lives continue under that pressure and stress, somehow or another slowly we begin to flood face disappointment and hurts and it continues to mount and the hope seems to fade. And under that constant pressure, suddenly that joy is sapped. Our sight dulls, and we're persuaded to look elsewhere for our hope. The last time I attended Matins at the Augustinian Monastery, we started out the same way. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. And I did, I'm, I'm, I'm. There was a priest who had been in the monastery over 50 years. Every day, for 50 years, he had started his life that same way. And I went up to him and I said, don't you get tired of it sometimes? Wouldn't you like to just shake it up a little bit? And he just shook his head at me and he said, oh, you Lutherans. <laughs> but then he said, don't you know, you can never tell the truth to You can never tell the truth to what? Here is the remarkable truth about this day, about this week. Whether we say Hosanna, whether we say crucify, this Jesus still comes. He knows what is waiting for him in Jerusalem, yet he will not stop. This Jesus continues to enter into our world, into our lives, into this church. And he doesn't come to fulfill our hopes and our dreams and our expectations and wish, wish lists. He comes so that the love of this God can begin to transform us so that we begin to hope and dreams God hopes for us. 
And we begin to live God's expectations of what our life can look like. The love of this God comes marching in the midst of Hosanna, in the midst of Crucify. It comes whether we block his path or whether we follow him. Whether we approach this week with casual apathy or with joy and commitment. In death, in life. The love of our God keeps riding on. This is the truth of our God in Jesus. This is the truth of Holy Week. This is the truth we can never say too often. I'll see you Thursday night for chapter 2. <laughs> <laughs>